Welcome aboard Politics Done Right uh, from the Bridge Alliance Conference. I'm here today with the one and only Carolyn Lukens Meyer, and I tell you, she's with the National Institute of Civil Discourse, something that we need badly. Anyhow, how are you doing today? I'm doing great and glad to be with you. Thank you so kindly. Look, you told me earlier on that you are not really into politics. Interestingly, it seemed like you've always been with politics. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I'm going to go way back. Go way back. Please do. I grew up in a very large multi-generational family in mm -hmm. a small town in Iowa. Okay. And in Iowa, the way in which we are raised in terms of family and religion and school very much hones to the moral values that are the core to what our country was founded on. Mm -hmm. I feel very blessed to have had that background. In today's world, where we have such a profound division between urban, the way people in urban areas think about public policy and the way people in rural areas feel and think, although now I've lived the last 40 years of my life in very urban areas, mm -hmm. I have a background that I understand how people in farming and small towns how they feel their way of life is threatened, mm -hmm. how they feel they've been left out, that the America they thought they were part of, they don't see anymore. I hate to interrupt you as you tell that story, but um, you, you kind of hit a point. Uh, are they left out? Some are. Okay. In term, some really are. Okay. And there's two dimensions in which they're left out. And many, many people, particularly on both coasts and very, very elite educations, mm -hmm. really still do not understand, even having looked at the results of the 2016 election. They, left, they feel left out in some cases because of the economy. Mm -hmm. And they indeed have been left behind. They are no longer in a place where their children and their grandchildren have the capacity to earn more than they did, mm -hmm. which is the definition of the American dream. Right, right. The second way in which many of them feel left out is culturally. As we have attempted, and sometimes we do it well and sometimes we do it poorly, but as the country as a whole has opened more to be blessed and treat our diversity as an asset, Many people whose life experience has stayed encapsulated in their original county mm -hmm. do not have the experience of how that cultural diversity is a positive. So some of those people feel left out economically, some of those people feel left out culturally, and some of those people feel left out in both ways. Now, I, I wanted to carry this conversation somewhere else, but I mean, uh, as I expect from somebody like yourself, uh, you've taken it somewhere else, and I want to explore that a bit. How, uh, you're saying that as far as their experience is concerned, they feel left out on those three issues. Um, I, I don't want to put it as far as whose fault. How could it be different? What could, who, or rather, who should make that different? Well, that's a very good question. I actually would locate responsibility for making it different. That's the word. Who's responsible? I, that's what I should have asked. For, I think, where we are now, just taking the reality of what mm -hmm. exists today, mm -hmm. I believe that the responsibility for making that different and getting over this crisis of belongingness in the country, the responsibility lays in three places. First of all, it does lay with the people themselves. They have the capacity to in fact expose themselves to more difference, no matter where they are living. Mm -hmm. So we should never walk away from my responsibility to deal with the issues in my life in whatever ways are in my control. Equally important in terms of where the responsibility lay, it is in our public policy. And it is in our public policy both at the state level and at the federal level. And frankly, Neither Democrats nor Republicans have had a platform of public policy issues relative to education, relative to jobs, that would help the people that I just spoke about mm -hmm. who have truly been left behind economically. And the third place that this lays is the way in which we all get our information. And I would put that both in educational institutions and in our media. Mm -hmm. And frankly, our media now dominates most people's consciousness right. more than education. But the way our media treats the coverage of the people that I'm talking about that feel like they don't belong, mm -hmm. by definition, it reinforces for those people 
that elites in this country are making judgments about them, how intelligent they are, what their morals are. And if that was happening to you or I, and you as a black man mm -hmm. and myself as a woman, it has happened to both of right. us. Not as extremely as the people right. I'm not talking about, not right. over several decades, but you and I both have lived experience right. of what it feels like for institutions with power to describe our reality in a way that we know in our hearts, our minds, and our souls is not true. That is, I mean, that's prescient. Now, what do we need to do about that? And do you see a conference like this, the Bridge Alliance Conference, as something that can mitigate that? Is this, is this a conference that can really uh, put the different organizations together that can get the, politi get the political strength uh, to force the, that will onto the body politic? That is clearly the vision and the mission of the Bridge Alliance. And I've been a member of the board since the very beginning. I'm mm -hmm. very proud of how far we've come, and we have a long way to go to have enough political power or enough influence with the media relative to how lives in the country are portrayed to do this, even as large as we are, mm -hmm. on our own. Right. We've made great progress in just the last two years in terms of the diversity of our own membership, by age, by gender, by race. We have to do even more with that. We also have to get really into the weeds about how do we create the ability for real collaboration for this 90 organizations that make up this alliance. The way in which most nonprofits are funded in this country mm -hmm. creates, by definition, competition. Right. So maybe your organization and my organization know we could do something if we could work together, but we're not in a circumstance where we can go for funding together. together right. And there's improvement on that regard as well. Philanthropic foundations in this country or organizations are beginning to understand that, but we have a long distance to go before the funds match where the words are. And the work. And the work in terms of what it would take to collaborate to actually evolve enough. It's a combination, really, mm -hmm. of people power and political power to make a shift in a way that we deal with this horrid set of divisions and dysfunction that have permeated our politics, but it's now like a virus in the country. It's in our homes, it's in our churches and synagogues and mosques, it's in the places that we work at the institute. Right. We get calls from every institution in the country mm -hmm. and from parents. We've got two daughters. They're both in New England right. schools. They're coming home for Thanksgiving. They haven't talked to each other mm -hmm. since the election. What can we do to have a decent Thanksgiving dinner? Right, right. That's how it sounds with a family. But when you go up the ladder, we get calls from corporations. We have product development teams, which you know are mm -hmm. the future of our company, exactly. that have not come back to the same level of productivity since the 2016 election. As a board member of the Bridge Alliance, first let me commend what you all have done between last year and this year. Hmm. I think you need to bottle it because it was something that was intentional to make sure that this conference reflected what America looks like. I go to progressive uh, conferences throughout the country. I go to uh, transpartisan mm -hmm. conferences throughout the country. And this is an, the first conference that I've seen at this level of looking the way the country looks. Thank you. So I think it was, it's a hell of a job, and it, is show, it shows that uh, the intentionality paid off. And, and I know I speak for the entire board and for the founders when I say what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. I, it's wonderful what we've done in the last year and fantastic that it's that observable. Mm -hmm. But we're not finished yet, and we're right. not all the way there yet. Right, but again, it, you, you, the, the most important thing first is observability. If, if observability is a word, yes. you well, have to observe it first yeah. before it becomes a reality, you know? It's true. It, it is true. So, I mean, anyhow, what do you expect out of, uh, out of the conference by the end of the conference? Well, I think the challenge that Debelin and David set out for us, along with all the partners that they worked with, is to actually contrast mm -hmm. the reality we're living in in 2019 mm -hmm. 
to what could be true in 2039 mm -hmm. if we could identify both the challenges we're facing, the assets that we have already, the assets that we could bring to the table, and really has supported us envisioning what would be possible if in fact we brought the kind of collective collaborative effort to bear that you've just acknowledged. So what I expect out of the end of the conference is some very interesting viable ideas about what we actually could do in this country starting now on two things that should always be dealt with simultaneously. Our collective and individual behavior, so it's the social side, the cultural side, and the structural side. Our politics are as dysfunctional as they are today for a set of structural reasons. They're not because we plopped a bunch of bad people into right. seats in Congress. Right. It's too much money in politics. It's gerrymandering. It's the way primaries work. I could go on. We have to attack those structural issues. But at the same time, we have to create the spaces in this country where our hearts and our minds mm -hmm could once again recognize that we are both human beings. Even if you are the most liberal person that I can imagine and I'm the most conservative person that you can imagine, that ideology is a tiny part of who we are. We're alive on this planet, blessed to be here, because we are both human beings. And we have moved away from understanding that there is more that connects us we have more in common. You may love the wall, I may hate the wall, but bottom line, if I learn who you are and where you came from and what made you the person you are, we're gonna like each other and we're gonna figure out some way to solve those differences by coming to something. Neither one of us is gonna get what we mm -hmm. want, but we're gonna be back at the table and we're gonna solve the problems. That's the capacity we've lost. We lost it in our Congress, we've begun to lose it in our communities, and I believe at the end of this conference, we aren't going to solve this whole thing, but we're going to walk out of here with some concrete ideas that could be part of the process of, in 2039, looking back to say, we really are now living in a participatory democracy in which our representatives are carrying out the will of the people. Enough said. Carolyn, thank you so kindly for being a part of the Bridge Alliance. Thank you so kindly for being on Politics Done Right. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. <laughs>